All right, guys, so today we have one more follow-up with Dr. Nick Radimus. This is gonna be definitely a more technical slide. He's just gonna be explaining it. He presented this at a conference recently, and so he decided to explain it again for us here. I hope you guys can appreciate it. It definitely delves a little bit deeper into the science. Uh, like I said, he's going over a PowerPoint slide here, but if you are interested in kind of nerding out about this stuff, this is definitely for you, and I think it kind of shows and exemplifies his intelligence in this area. So again, I hope you guys enjoy. All right, so now here you have your skeletal muscle cell, okay? Back in the day, it was thought that you had to be free testosterone or free DHT to enter through the cell membrane to get inside a skeletal muscle fiber, okay? Well, there's proteins now, for example, megalin is one that has been shown to internalize T bound to SHBG. So now they don't even have to be dislocated, it looks like, or dissociated the whole complex might be internalized so that's one thing right but number one here you have genomic signaling testosterone binds to the androgen receptor heat shock proteins dissociate the whole uh, the whole uh, complex gets transported into the nucleus binds to androgen response elements on the target gene these are where the co-regulator proteins come in that it can either inhibit or help more of the co-regulators are actual co-activators they actually help as opposed to inhibit, okay? And then you have your protein synthesis down here. Now again, your ribosomal biogenesis, which we were just talking about, that's taking place right down here. That's the final spot of the anabolic pathway here, right? The androgen receptor itself, when it's phosphorylated, it becomes more active as well. So there are other molecules that can phosphorylate it internally, which can change its transcriptional activity as well. Number two is known as the beta-catenin signaling pathway. And there's a couple things going on here. Here's your androgen receptor bound uh, testosterone complex. It can block glycogen synthase kinase 3, which then creates more beta catenin to bind. And beta catenin is a transcription factor which targets different genes but still produces proteins. Mm. But also, beta catenin is an anabolic intracellular signaling molecule. It needs to bind to proteins that actually have a sequence that can help it bind, so to speak. And the androgen receptor complex can do that as well. So it can positively influence that pathway in a couple of, of different ways, okay? Now, pathway number three, here we're looking at the non-genomic. So androgen receptors have been found in the cell membrane, and when that happens, there's multiple activities. One, through G protein signaling, you might have increased intracellular calcium, which might affect acute performance. But then here, these non-genomic pathways, that's what's also helping to signal some of those key anabolic pathways like mTOR C1, like the MAP kinases. Okay, we know these are main anabolic pathways in skeletal muscle. Non-genomic pathways of testosterone certainly have been shown to influence those positively. When you look at over here, this one's a little bit more, as a side note, the binding protein is SHBG it's thought to have some transcriptional activity. Again, how potent that is, some doubt that it plays much of a role, but I'll mention it there anyways. Now, over here, the androgen receptor complex bound to T can inhibit glucocorticoid activity, either through direct inhibition of binding or even down here. See, the interesting thing here, I have the androgen receptor shown. The glucocorticoid receptor, both of these compete for similar binding sites on the gene. So it's like a tug of war, right? right. Who's ever gonna win out? You want the anabolic to win out. So when you have more anabolism, less uh, glucocorticoid receptor action means less catabolism. So oftentimes, between 50 to 80% of the homology on the target gene here is shared by these two receptors. So when you have this complex here playing a larger role as opposed to the glucocorticoid activity, that's more conducive to anabolism and then we have satellite cells, okay? So satellite cells possess androgen receptors, and when testosterone and androgens will bind to the androgen receptor, that increases the proliferation and differentiation, meaning that increases myogenesis. We know myogenesis is important for muscle fiber formation, recovery, you name it. But over here as well, okay, higher order stem cells, okay, have androgen receptors, and when testosterone binds to those, that has been shown to actually drive the cell cycle more towards myogenesis instead of adipogenesis. So this pathway, again, 
in, in this state, okay, these stem cells could become fat cells over time, adipogenesis, mm -hmm. right? When testosterone binds, they're more likely to become muscle, wow, to okay. Im impact skeletal muscle via myogenesis. So you talk about the cell cycle. Remember back in the day we talked about the cell cycle back in our kinase class, right. right? You can push it towards the muscle side with androgen binding, right? And then, uh, well, the point I was making too is when you look at these co-regulators, that's going to be an interesting area, okay? And there's more than 300 co-regulators now. It's a very an untapped area of research from a training standpoint. Uh, one thing I mentioned before is that there are some companies, you know, using those co-regulators to target drugs, especially the co the co-repressor. So if you inhibit a co-activator or stimulate a co-repressor, that reduces androgen action. And some companies are looking at that now to help as another potential treatment for men with prostate cancer. Anti-androgenic uh, treatments are used for prostate cancer. So that's an interesting area right there now for that. But uh, ultimately, could that be used for training? Uh, yep, I'm sure. <laughs> sure.